Hi, I really just wanted to start out by thanking Project Inspire for the opportunity to be part of this wonderful series where we're talking about the power of Jewish women, their mystique and their greatness. So I give a course um, on the power of women to be able to transform their marriage by implementing tools that really help shift the environment in their home. And the truth is it can be difficult at any period, at any stage, but nothing has been more challenging than trying to implement changes during this whole corona period. For a lot of us, it's kind of just been survival mode. And many of us, myself included, have just been overtaxed, not just with the wife and mother, but you know, now becoming the teacher and the entertainer and the housekeeper and the maid and the referee. So part of me kind of feels like the last thing anyone wants is another responsibility, some new to-dos to kind of help out. And yet, on the other hand, I've had people reach out to me that they're really craving some guidance, hoping that their marriages are not gonna fall apart during these challenging times. So the truth is my goal for tonight is I just wanna share some ideas with you that hopefully at some point in the day you can think about, you can reflect on, you can see would any of these points help you? Would they be relevant to your relationship? Could they help increase some intimacy? And if that is, you know, if, you're there, if that's a takeaway from you, then that's awesome. Okay, so my husband always tells me that I have to start with a joke. And this is one that I just feel completely captures our feminine power. So if you heard it, sorry. So there is a couple, a mayor and his wife, and they are driving through Texas. And um, at some point they're running out of gas and they finally find a gas station and they pull up to the pump. And as they're pulling up, the wife starts slowly kind of hiding down in her seat. And her husband looks at her and she's like, honey, what are you doing? She's like, oh my gosh, you wouldn't believe this. I almost married that gas station attendant. And the husband looks at her and he's like, oh my gosh, like you are so lucky. Like you married me, the mayor. And she looks at him and she says, what are you talking about? If I had married him, he would have been the mayor. It's one of my favorite jokes, but it really talks to the power of our feminine ability. And so that's what we're going to talk about, right? So let's start. What is intimacy, right? We've all heard into me, you see. It's not just about relations, physical relations. It's about connection, closeness, oneness, right? In Judaism, we say that everything in the world was created with a male energy and a female energy, right? The male energy we call mashpia, to be an influencer. And a female energy is a mekabel, to be able to receive that influence, to be able to receive that flow, to work with it, to develop it. Now, everyone, everything consists of both energies, but for the purpose of a marriage perspective, we're going to talk about being able to use the dynamic of the woman's ability to be macabre, her innate power to be able to transform the environment in her home by using this specific energy of receiving. Now, what's interesting is that it's counterintuitive, right? Because it seems like as the mashpia, as the influencer, they're the ones in control. But really, it's actually the opposite, where we have the ability to kind of initiate the flow. It kind of it's not a passive role, it's a very active role. And it kind of reminds me of like a nursing baby. Like a mother might have a tremendous amount of milk to give, but if a baby's not nursing, she doesn't, it doesn't start the flow and initiate it and make it keep going. So we have that ability to awaken that flow in our husbands and to initiate it, to awaken within our husbands the desire to want to be able to give to us and have us receive graciously. And we also, have the power to turn that off. So that is our feminine power and we really do want to use it wisely. So the premise of this talk is that God created man with a desire to make his wife happy. And for those of you who might question that, is that, you know, ask your husbands, ask men, and anyone will tell you, of course I want to make my wife happy. You know, no matter what's going on in the relationship, when things are good, they want to make their wife happy. So as long as I'm not innocently covering it up, and I say innocently because nobody would actually choose to want to intentionally cover up their husband's desire to make them happy, but we do it innocently and we do it in two different ways. One is by not being a macabre, not receiving what it is that your husband is bringing to the table, not making space for him to be able to make you happy. And the second way we innocently cover it up is by being disrespectful by getting kind of critical, controlling, when we're not really using our feminine power properly. So the first way, what does it mean to not be a receiver? 
Well, as an example, let's say somebody gives you a compliment. How do you receive it, right? Are you the type of person who says, thank you, and they just kind of move on? Are you the kind of person who, oh, what do you mean, like this old thing? Like, oh, what are you talking about? I look so fat. Or no, I don't look great. You look great. You know, like, do we kind of somehow block that ability to receive that compliment that's giving, that's coming our way? Do I somehow innocently cut off his ability to, to give by the way I'm receiving, right? When your husband buys you roses, do you say, oh, I really would have preferred lilacs? You know, when he buys you a necklace, do you kind of say, oh, I really didn't need a necklace? You know, I remember when we got married, my husband used to buy me flowers for showers. And at a certain point, I was kind of like, you know, it's such a waste of money. Like, don't bother buying me flowers. I mean, it's just a waste of money. And he, you know, sounds practical. He kind of agreed. Like, okay, so stop buying me flowers. And it wasn't until a couple, a couple years ago, actually, that I have a bunch of boys. And I was like, you know, they're going to get married. And their wives are going to expect that they buy them flowers for Shabbos. Because they're going to be like, my father bought my mother flowers for Shabbos. I really think that you really should start buying me flowers for Shabbos so that they see that it's an important thing. But the point of the story is like, I was controlling him not buying me flowers because I wasn't receiving them graciously. And I was also controlling when he should start buying me flowers again. So at some level, without my realizing it, I'm, I'm cutting off his ability to give because I wasn't receiving. Um, I've done it also with like, he, he, part of it is I would, I would claim that I'm just so practical. We don't want to waste money. But he would give me gifts and I would kind of, no, don't spend the money. To the point that recently my um, kids went with my husband to buy me a couple years ago to buy me a birthday present. And as I got in the car, one of my kids went to take the um, price tag off of the gift. And my husband was like, no, 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 don't do that. Mommy will be so much happier to know that I didn't spend a lot of money. And he's right. <laughs> but that to me makes me realize like, wow, I've really cut off his ability to want to give, to want to buy for me. And it's not, it has, it's not worth it. I end up losing out on it. You know, when he offers to help, do I say thank you? Or do I innocently kind of say what's wrong with the help that he gave? You know, like I can walk in and be like, oh, I thought you said you were going to clean up the kitchen. And he's kind of like, I did. You know, like he's gotten the message, like your help is not really good enough. But however you're doing it, it's not right. And that we innocently teach them that if they spend too much money on us, it's not good enough. If they don't spend enough money on us, it's not good enough, right? We teach them if they didn't give me enough time, it's not good enough. If you gave me too much time and you're too available, you're needy, it's not good enough, right? We teach them that they don't really know how to listen because ugh, stop trying to solve my problem. We've just innocently taught them that they might not be able to be successful at making us happy. And then we kind of wonder, like, well, wait a minute, why am I not getting the flowers or the jewelry or the compliments or the help or even just the appreciation that we want? And the last thing that our husband wants to do is feel like a failure. And when we are not happy, when he can't give in a way that we receive and makes us happy, he feels like a failure. So the truth is, like, what is at the root of that? Is that just like a... Like, what's at the root of him feeling like a failure? So Moshe Weinberg has this great talk where he talks about how Hashem created man from Afar, from dust. And by definition, it's like unsubstantial. It's got no value. And a man kind of spends his whole life trying to feel substantial, trying to feel valuable, having self-worth. Whereas women, we were created from bone, from something that already has substance, right? So although we have our own issues, we might struggle with our own insecurities, I believe for most women, there's a little bit of a knowing, a deep down, that I'm, I'm valuable, and you really need to see that value and appreciate me for that value. So when we, but men can always be craving, like, to feel worthy and valuable. It's a different kind of way of doing it, but that, that's, it, to be aware of that, that that feeling of failure is very, very deep for them. So we, when we don't receive their overtures, when we don't receive their gifts or their time, they could end up feeling unworthy. Okay, the second way that we innocently might cover up our husband's desire to make us happy is by being disrespectful. Now, if you asked me, I would be like, I'm such a nice person. <laughs> like, I'm so not disrespectful. Yet when I realized that there are actually certain types of behaviors that can be interpreted as disrespectful, I realized, wow, actually, I kind of do a lot of those behaviors and they might be being interpreted as disrespectful. Okay, so what are those behaviors? I call them the four C's. 
criticizing, contradicting, controlling, or correcting. That whenever I'm doing any of those four C's, I am sending a message that is disrespectful. So how can we stop being this way? Really, by avoiding these four C's. Because when we are controlling, we're undermining their deepest fear that they're not worthy and valuable. And when they feel disrespected, it actually strengthens their belief about themselves that I'm not good enough. And of course, then you're going to see people, you know, they get defensive and they put up all their walls to try and protect themselves. And you wouldn't know it, but they feel disrespected, disrespected and it doesn't really help. So when I tell my husband, you know, how to pack the car, <laughs> you know, it used to be like, we they'd put the stuff in the car and I would kind of take everything out, but you'll have the strollers and the thing, like, and I would be like, I have like this spatial ability to see how to pack things better. And so I would kind of redo whatever he did. And then, you know, 20 years later, I'm kind of like, why am I schlepping the stuff to the car and packing the car? Because I taught him that he can't really pack the car the right way. You know, when I tell him like, why are you yelling at the kids over something so minor? Or when I just say like, why did you do that? Or are you going to call the doctor? When are you going to call the teacher? Are you sure you want to eat that? You know, when I roll my eyes because I don't really agree with something that he said, all of these things, I'm sending a message that's disrespectful, that I don't trust that you can handle life. And our husbands have learned also that we can't trust them to get the kids to bed on time because we're controlling how they're doing it, that we don't trust them, that they can entertain them properly when we go out. You know, like I do everything in my power to kind of keep the kids busy. And then all of a sudden I go out for an hour and I come home and they watch the video. You know, like I kind of send the message, maybe I don't trust that you're gonna pay the bill. So I kind of have taken over financially. Maybe I don't trust you to clean up the kitchen the way I want. You know, so a man at some point is just going to decide, I can't be successful in her eyes, no matter what. So why am I going to bother trying? I'm going to just stop offering my help because no matter how I do it, it's never good enough. And the truth is, the message that you want to be sending is I trust you. When we hold back from the four C's, we are sending the message, I trust you. And the greatest thing is that in Judaism, we have this really precious gift called tshuva, which literally means to return. But when we mess up, as we always do, I mean, it's constant that I can get controlling, right? All I have to do is apologize. It's the quickest way to return, as it says, to return and restore intimacy, to just acknowledge, to apologize, to say, wow, I didn't mean to get controlling or contradict you and apologize. Now, if your husband doesn't feel respected, which he's not going to. If you're blaming him or shaming him or complaining a lot, he's probably acting very defensively. And in the need to defend himself and kind of restore his own sense of self-worth after being put down, he might get reactive, maybe even nasty. Now, I'm not saying it's okay for him to be nasty or to have bad mitos or bad character traits or get angry. But what I am saying is that I need to kind of reflect on, am I doing or saying anything that's kind of kicking up his insecurity? Because if I am, I really have to stop and ask myself, like, is it worth it? Is it worth the intimacy that I lose when he gets that feeling and gets defensive? So when you try to help fix or even teach your husband how to do something better, you're actually emasculating your spouse. Now, we might think like, I'm just being helpful, but he takes it as it's being critical. Now, when I catch myself wanting to help <laughs> with any of these things, I have to stop and ask myself, okay, which is more important? My intimacy or my helping? You know, my intimacy or my getting it done right? My intimacy or my being right? I have, like, I have this vision in my head, you know, like every moment it's like, I can be right or I can have intimacy, but I can't have both. And the minute I'm right, I'm making him wrong. And by definition, that will kill our intimacy. Now I totally get that there are people who will feel like some women will be like offended, like, oh, this is so annoying. Why is it all on me? You know, he also can be disrespectful. He also has his control issues, you know? Why does he get to be right and I don't get to be right, you know? And it could be true. But like a tip for tat kind of relationship, you know, where I'm constantly keeping score, looking for how things could be really equal, like, that would be great. We might have equality, but we're not going to have intimacy. 
you know, relatively healthy relationship, right? It's actually quite disempowering when we fall into playing that like victim kind of, it's not fair, it shouldn't be this way, you should have to change too. Why do we have to do all the work? You know, why doesn't he have to change and stop doing the four C's? You know, don't get me wrong. Anyone listening to this, if any partner in a relationship is going to avoid the four C's, you're gonna have a better relationship. There's nothing to talk about. But tonight's class, right, we're kind of talking about the woman's power to transform her home. We're talking about owning our own greatness to be able to shift the atmosphere and with our own self-control, right? So don't be so quick to give that power away. Once we learn to respect each other's space and use of time, the overall atmosphere is gonna to start to change. You know, disrespect kills intimacy. And as soon as that is cleaned up, he kind of becomes like this blooming flower again, you know, ready to make you happy. So if the baseline is, I trust that he wants to make me happy. Like that's his design. That's how God designed him. Then I'm, when I use my feminine power and I act that way, even if inside I might, you know, question it. But when I, when I act that way, I'm enhancing the relationship. When we learn how to express our desires in a way that our husbands can actually hear them, our requests and our desires become a roadmap to intimacy. It's a roadmap that he can follow as knowledge about what makes you happy. But our husbands aren't mind readers, right? Very often, I have to be honest, we're not even aware of what we want and what we desire, let alone think that they're gonna be able to figure it out. But then we get mad when they haven't figured it out, you know? But if I haven't stated a desire or a request, how can I assume that he knows what I want? Like, I'll just tell you a silly story, right? So last year, I was making a barbecue, and I happened to be the one who grills, and I could definitely have issues like, why am I the griller? But okay, I am. And I'm making this barbecue. And it happens to be, are there times that I make dinner and my husband's running late or I didn't eat lunch. I ate lunch early and I was hungry. So I end up eating before he gets home and I, we don't end up eating dinner together. There definitely are times that that happens. So it wouldn't be unusual to not eat at the exact same time. But I it was a Sunday and I was making all the, the barbecue. I grilled the chicken and my husband made a comment like, I'm really hungry. So I was like, oh, you know what? I have some onion soup. I'll give you the onion soup. And in my mind, like that'll tide you over. So I gave him the onion soup and I'm finishing grilling. The chicken was done. So I brought it in and I put it on the table and I was still doing the vegetables and the potatoes. And I come back in and he's eating the chicken. And I felt this like surge of anger <laughs> rise up in me that instead of saying anything, I kind of like quickly went back onto the deck and started like breathing. And I'm like, what is getting me so upset? Like I had to like stop it. Like I know I have, the, I have the trust that he wants to make me happy. So I'm sitting there thinking, trying to figure out what is going on that I'm feeling so upset and angry. And after I breathed and I kind of the intensity slowed down, it hit me like I had a desire that we eat together, that you kind of wait for the whole barbecue to be finished and I get to sit down like a bench and we could all eat together. And I didn't express that desire. So he would have no way of knowing that. And he was like, sometimes you eat first, sometimes I eat first. So I came back in and I was like, I don't even understand. Like, why are you eating? Like, I gave you the, the onion soup. That was supposed to tide you over, you know? Like, I got all bothered about it. But I realized after the fact that he was kind of like, I, I, okay, but I was still hungry. So I'm eating the chicken. Like, he didn't even think he did anything wrong. And objectively, he didn't do anything wrong. But subjectively, from my perspective, I was so mad at him. And it could have been a time that if I didn't have enough awareness that, oh, I didn't express my desire, I probably could have get, maybe I would have said not nice words, maybe I would have, you know, totally pulled back whatever I would have done. But to be able to be aware, like, wait a minute, when I express my, if I had said I'd really love to eat dinner together, I'd really love the whole grilling process to be done, he would have happily waited. He would have happily waited. How many issues and fights and things could we avoid if we were aware of our own desires and had the ability to express them because he really would want to be able to listen, right? Many times the key to making a request, expressing desire, is giving him the space to be able to fulfill it in his way, in his time, right? If you find that your husband consistently does not want to fulfill your requests, you can probably assume 
that your environment is filled with disrespect and control on your part. And I'm not saying you're a disrespectful person. I'm saying you're doing these actions of the four C's that are somehow making him feel disrespected. And chances are you're being controlling about how and when it should get done. Like I remember at some point I wanted him to fill out forms for registration for something. And um, I had made a request. I had just expressed the desire. I'd really love the forms to be filled out. And I found it very frustrating that the forms kept not getting filled out. And at the same time, I had to realize like, wait a minute, I can express my desire. He knows this will make me happy, but I also have to be able to let go of how and when it's going to get done. And it was in my face being able to see how controlling I was. Cause like after day one, after day two, you know, like at a certain point I said like, wow, like I'd really love the forms to be filled out by the end of the week, <laughs> you know, uh, trying to in a nice way to be controlling, but just that point of being able to be aware that my getting controlling about it, it doesn't give him the opportunity. And I've had many people ask, you know, but what happens when you really need to get the like form filled out. Like what happens when you really don't want to pay the late fee for the bill and he hasn't done it? And it's true. It's a very good question. It's a very good point. But still the question in my mind is to ask, and I even asked my husband that question about like, you know, so what happens if, you know, the reason the woman is paying the bills is because she doesn't trust her husband's going to pay and they don't want to get a late fee. It's not worth a late fee. I might as well get on his case to pay the bills. And he said, you know, maybe it's possible that $25 or $50 late fee is worth the price of admission, you know, worth the price of the intimacy to not make him feel bad about not doing something. And I thought that was really valuable. That was really like spot on. I have to stop and ask myself, yes, there are times things do have to get done, but is it worth the intimacy that I'm going to lose if I get controlling about it? Is there a way for me to be able to express it that he will be able to respond and hear without my being controlling? So here's a good tip to kind of help clarify why he might not be fulfilling your request, okay? So to ask yourself, is this request, is it even a request, is it a suggestion, is it kind of more of a demand or, or a comment? Is it in my Daladamos or is it in his Daladamos? What's a Daladamos? So some of you may remember that line, this is my dance space, this is your dance space. You don't come into mine and I don't come into yours, right? This is my dollar almost. This is my personal space. This is on my side of the street. And this is your dollar almost. This is your personal space. This is this is on your plate. This is on your side of the street. So what's in my space and what's in my husband's, right? So I have control over my choices, right? I get to choose like how I want to dress and how I want to speak and what kind of tone I'm going to use? What's my attitude going to be? Um, what am I going to do in my spare time? How am I going to use my phone? What am I going to eat? What am I not going to eat? You know, am, am, when am I going to go to sleep? Am I going to exercise? Am I going to pray? Am I not going to pray? Like these are all choices that I get to make. They're in my dot almost. So your husband, and I'm going to throw in your teens as well. I find that avoiding the four C's with your teens goes a long way for building a relationship. They have their own daladamos, their own personal space, what they eat, how they dress, how they use their phones, what they watch, when they get up, whether they exercise or not, when they go to sleep, like it's not on my page, it's their business. And it's funny because there is a place in the Torah, right, that says a woman was created as an Azer Konegdo, right, to be a helpmate opposite him opposite your husband. So the place where I just kind of found that I kept messing up was in my belief that like as an Asia Connecto, as a helpmate, it's my job to help you. It's my job to help you be better at all these things that are in your Dalamos. So my husband kind of feels that that sounds a little bit arrogant, but I do kind of think there's this general belief by women you know, that, that somehow, I don't know, we're better at certain things. We're better at organizing time management, being disciplined, following rules, making plans, right? So kind of like felt like, well, if, if I'm better at it, then it must be my job as an Asian connector to help you, right? I can help you be better at staying on your diet keeping a schedule, calling, reminding you to call your mother for Mother's Day or her birthday, right? Motivating you to exercise, reminding you when it's time to pray, helping you get to bed on time. I could even help you with getting it programmed to control your anger. Like there was this sense, but the truth is, I don't know about your husband. My husband doesn't appreciate that outlook or my help in any area that's in his domain. 
unless he invites me in and asks me to help, which there definitely are times that he might. But I see it come up in these small little ways, right? So one day he came home from synagogue and we were, he, they were much later than usual. So usually we have a kiddush and then we eat lunch. But I know that my husband is usually dieting. So since they were so late, he had made this kid, he had put out the stuff to make the kiddush. And before it was about to start, I said like, are you sure you want to have kiddush now? Or maybe we should just start the meal a little bit earlier. Now, I wasn't in touch with what was my desire. What was it that I really wanted? But he completely took it as being controlling. Like, almost like, what's your point? Like, you see the herring and the crackers on the table. Like, what is it that you're trying to say? What is it that you want? And it's just that ability to be aware, like, it's in his dog almost what he eats, how he does it. Like, it's not my problem. It's not my job. It's not my responsibility. I kind of have to be willing to let go. And I have to make sure that if I did have a desire that I wanted to eat earlier, I needed to express that desire. I didn't need to couch it in, oh, you shouldn't eat something. Or I shouldn't pretend I have a desire to eat earlier, couching it and trying to control that he doesn't eat so much, right? In the end of the day, he wanted a wife when he got married. He already had a mother. And I just need to know that when I try to control these things, I'm sending a message to him that I just don't trust you to be the man, right? That's more destructive to the relationship than you getting him to do the things that you want in the way and time that you want to do it. Okay, so how can you build up your man, right? By giving him opportunities to be your hero. When you use your feminine power properly, you can make him feel like a million bucks, right? So how do you use it properly? So by receiving what he has to give, by learning to express your desires and your needs in a way that he can hear, right? Like we said, complaints and blaming is gonna put him back to feeling like a failure. It's gonna make him get all defensive and, and distant. It's the opposite of what we're looking for, right? It's a skill to learn to be able to ask for something, to express something without nagging about it, without controlling how or when it's going to get done, without complaining that it hasn't gotten done yet, without nagging some more because I think he forgot what it was that I asked him to do, right? We have to figure out how to be able to express gratitude. Gratitude is going to be a great way to build him up. Like I remember when I first started expressing desires, so I expressed like, I'd really love the garbage to be taken out. See, in my house, I was kind of always doing everything. Um, and I, at a certain point, was like, I can't stand people taking out the garbage. So I would take out the garbage and I would put it by the front door. And somehow, he'd leave for synagogue. I mean, how in the world did you, you had to basically step over that garbage bag in order to get out the door. How did you not notice the garbage bag? Like at a certain point, like, come on now, take out the garbage. And I get it's a small minor example, but it, it could be, you could give any example. So I started expressing this desire. I'd really love the garbage to be taken out. And I noticed that as we cleaned up the environment, as I really was avoiding the four C's and not being controlling and not correcting him, how he was supposed to do it and when, not contradicting, all these kind of things, I started noticing he would actually not only take out the garbage without any problem when it was by the front door, he'd actually start taking it out of the bin. He'd actually, he'd see me taking it out, go, no, no, let me take that. And then he'd actually start being proactive when the garbage was full to be like, let me take that out for you. To the extent, to the extent that at a certain point, you know, you, when you give compliments, you, you have to give a compliment and, and show gratitude and, and have it be genuine. But you kind of can't have a backhanded compliment. So one day he had taken out the garbage and I go to throw something out and there's no bag in the garbage. And I'm kind of like, oh my gosh, like, can't you do the job right? When you take out the garbage, you have to put a new bag in. And that would have been like an old way of like correcting, like, oh, thank you for helping, but like, let me stab you in the back, like, but you didn't put the bag in. And so I just kind of decided, you know, I'm just going to ask him, like, just as, you know, I'm just so curious, like, what's the reason you don't put a bag back in rather than complaining about it or blaming about it? And he's like, you know, it's so interesting that you're asking me because I don't do it on purpose. And I'm thinking, why would you not do that on purpose? And he said, because I totally get it. you get pleasure. Sounds kind of crazy, but I, it makes me really happy when he takes out the garbage. He said, but there are times that if I took out the garbage and then I put a bag back, you actually wouldn't even notice that I did that. And I'm really only doing it for you. So I want you to get that pleasure. And I just thought like, wow, 
in a certain way that was so nice. And he's totally right. If he had put a bag back, I wouldn't have even known that he did it. So now, instead of being annoyed about it, I totally understand and appreciate. No problem. I'll put the bag in. And I'm really grateful that you took it out. I used to think that he had to deserve my gratitude, right? That he had to deserve my respect, that he has to be respectable for me to respect him, that he had to be trustworthy for me to trust him. Now I'm kind of seeing that if I choose respect and trust, if I act as if I respect and trust him, not only will he start showing up more respectable and more trustworthy, I actually internally really start feeling more respect and trust for him. So I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg, but I do know that today I'm choosing to choose respect and trust in order to break that cycle. So in summary, okay, we women have a tremendous power to transform the atmosphere in our home. And as long as we don't innocently cover up our husband's natural desire to want to make us happy, that is going to flow out of him. If we use our feminine power at being a receiver properly, at being able to receive our husband's compliments, his gifts, his help, his love, we will keep the flow going. He will feel successful at making us feel good. And then he's going to want to do it more. Whenever someone feels good at something, it makes them want to do it more. So remember we said that he was created, man's created from dust, and he naturally just feels unworthy, and his whole life is about trying to feel value. And it's our job to build him up and to kind of make him feel like our hero. A man wants to feel like your hero. Like to the extent, like, I, 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 I could kill bugs. I don't really have a problem with it. Well, some of them I'm, I'm not like. But like, I'll be like, can you come and kill a bug? You are my hero. Like just finding ways to make him know that. <clears throat> Tell him so. Send him a text, write a little love note, send an email, whatever it is, send me messages that are letting him know you are great and you make me happy is going to go a really long way for building him up. We don't want to be emasculating our husbands by controlling their daladamos, by controlling what's in their space. That's in their space. It's their privacy. It's their sacred ground, right? Their space is their space. And when we get in there and control it, we are destroying intimacy. So in any way that we can avoid the four C's, right? Criticizing, correcting, contradicting, or controlling. They're all going to be sure ways to alter the environment to be a more respectful and trusting one. I've had women say, once they started taking the course, like, I just can't believe how much I do the four C's. Like, I didn't really think I was such a controlling person. I didn't really think I corrected him so much. But all of a sudden, when you have all these small little examples of what might show up from his perspective as you kind of undermining, maybe you're undermining him in front of the kids and how he's disciplining, however, wherever it might be showing up, all of a sudden realizing just little questions. When are you coming home? What are you doing? They end up realizing, wow, I really do have a disrespectful environment. And then I was kind of wondering why things weren't going so well. Well, now just having the awareness, right? That's just the goal. We're, we're not, it's not about perfection. This is about an awareness, a consciousness. I want to be more respectful. I don't want to give in to that urgent, compelling need to have to control you because I need things to go my way. Like that's my problem with my own anxiety stuff, right? I got to ask Hashem for help with that. But if I'm willing to say, I'm going to hold back on those four C's and I'm going to do what I can to shift the environment so that it's more positive, that it's more respectful, you will see him start to show up differently. So I just want to remind us, right? Trust is a choice. Respect is a choice. Intimacy is a choice. And I really just want to give us all a blessing that even in these really emotionally challenging times that we dig deep, right? After all this is over, our kids are gonna return to school, whatever the new normal is gonna look like, they're gonna go back to college or back to Israel, wherever they might go, right? But it's our husbands that we're gonna be left with. And we want to know that we've invested in this relationship. We want it to be strong. We want it to be enjoyable and loving. We want it to be intimate. And that power is in your hands. That's the Jewish feminine power. Choose wisely.